Okay. Welcome back, everyone. Um, hope you enjoyed the cake uh, and the coffee. Some of you still uh, working through those. Um, I think the stage has been set beautifully for um, this next bit of our agenda and the symposium today. Um, one of the questions that came up uh, in the ta uh, you know, uh, in response to uh, James's wonderful uh, keynote um, in the discussion was, I think James, you raised this question: uh, Who sets priorities? in the research system. Um, now that's a question that, uh, you know, many of us have been concerned about for many years, 30 years um, at the very least. Um, I think Matthew, you raised the question uh, of, is it possible to have democratic input into the setting of research priorities? Um, great question, I think. And um, that's the focus for the panel discussion um, in this next uh, hour and a half. Uh, so if you aren't already aware, um, I think we have a really interesting opportunity here with uh, the Australian Chief Scientist Office um, releasing uh, a call for a review of the, the, the nation's uh, research, science and research priorities. Uh, this is separate to the ARC review that, you know, many of you may have heard more about. Um, I should point out that uh, the closing date for submissions to this call for input uh, on the uh, research priority setting process is the end of the month. So not uh, a long time left, but yeah, uh, 31st of March. Um, if you haven't already been on the website, uh, have a look at the conversation starter. Um, some of us will you know, get to the kind of details of this uh, as we get into the conversation. Um, but broadly speaking, um, the questions that the chief scientist office are interested in uh, is, uh, you know, have to do with what are the challenges facing uh, Australian um, uh, research systems, you know, the kinds of challenges that we need to be addressing. Um, what are the opportunities? What are the particular kind of strategic opportunities for, for us to contribute to uh, from a research perspective to some of these challenges um, in Australia? Uh, so there's... Um, uh, yeah, this, this process is very much happening. Um, I also understand that there is a national conversation beyond, you know, what's happening, of course, uh, in this room today. Uh, I, I understand that um, uh, people in the chief scientist's office have been going around the country, not just uh, cities, but also rural and regional uh, Australia, having conversations about these very uh, about this very issue. Uh, so I think it's really kind of timely and a really good opportunity for us to. Um, uh, contribute uh, in the next bit. Um, I did want to draw your attention to um, a document that's some, it could be a little bit hard to find, um, but I'd encourage you to look at the original terms of reference for this call that came out in um, late last year, September 22, I think it was, uh, and that sets a little bit of the background uh, which we are going to be talking about today. Uh, I think notable for from our uh, purposes, for, from our standpoints, uh, is a question in those original terms of reference, which highlights that um, you know, the, the aim here in research priority setting, science and research priority setting, is very much about an aspiration to contribute to social well-being and not just economic growth. Uh, and I think that is possibly music to many people's years, um, really interesting and sort of embedded in those terms of references, uh, terms of reference. Uh, but if I can just briefly summarize the three key um, objectives that were set out at that stage, uh, and now obviously these are going to evolve as, you know, the consultations take place. Uh, but one of those priorities will be no surprise, it's to do with climate change. So how can research systems um, and the priorities that are set in research systems, how can they contribute to the big um, problem of climate change. Uh, the second um, uh, priority there, or the second objective, if you like, is uh, recognizing, um, acknowledging, uh, and uh, um, sort of amplifying, if you like, uh, First Nation perspectives on science, technology, and innovation. Uh, so that's another one that was highlighted early on. Uh, and then the third objective uh, was a kind of recognition that we live at a time when there appear to be all these kinds of breakthroughs, emerging technologies, uh, and so forth. Um, so how should we approach them? How can they contribute um, 
to social well-being and not just economic growth. Uh, so th those were the first um, sort of objectives that came out at the end of last year. These are going to evolve um, as we go along the process. Uh, and I think there's real um, opportunity of, uh, here for us to contribute there. I do, uh, this is a little bit sideways, but I, I do also want to draw your attention to a parallel discussion that's been going on uh, led by the International uh, Science Council. Um, and they put out a report um, which came out, I think, a little more than a year back. Uh, and this was about uh, unleashing, look at the title of that, you know, it looks very much more of the same, unleashing science for sustainability, right? Looks a little bit top down. But if you actually read the report, um, really interesting stuff in there. Uh, they have a lot of provocative statements in there, including a uh, statement along the lines that, you know, much of the science system uh, actually doesn't contribute at all. Uh, to sustainable development goals, for example, or to social benefit. So, you know, quite strong statements uh, in there. And I understand that uh, this is a domain, uh, certainly on a global level, uh, where there's a lot of interest, there are sort of dialogues with research funders and so forth uh, on, on, this, uh, on this issue. Okay, so that's by way of back, uh, uh, background. Uh, and in order to um, help us through, uh, work through these, uh, these questions. We have a, a wonderful panel uh, of four um, lined up for today. So if I can invite them to come and take uh, the seats in the front. Um, first up is Fiona Fiddler, who's a professor uh, of uh, Meta Melb. I don't know if I've got that right, but this is the Meta Research um, sort of grouping in uh, Melbourne. Uh, Fiona is also a professor in the School of Historical and Philosophical Studies at uh, University of Melbourne. Thank you, Fiona. Uh, next up, Matt Kearns, Matthew Kearns, uh, professor in the School of Humanities and Languages at UNSW. Uh, and uh, I think, uh, uh, as James alluded to earlier, you know, Matt has also been working on these issues for, um, from an STS perspective for a long time. Um, next, we have Tamsin Peach, uh, associate professor and director of the Australian Center for Public History. Uh, at, the, um, at UTS, University of Technology, Sydney. Um, I recently came across a wonderful podcast that um, uh, Tamsin um, sort of uh, curates and coordinates on uh, public knowledge, uh, public history, fantastic. So if you've not uh, come across it before, um, please check it out. Uh, and last, but definitely not the least, um, we have Robin Scott, uh, who is industry professor at the Alfred Deakin uh, Institute um, here at uh, Deakin University. So it's my great pleasure to uh, welcome all of you to the panel. Um, so the way this is going to work is um, I'm going to invite each of the panelists to speak for no more than about five minutes on the issues of research priority setting. How can research systems uh, contribute to well-being and not just economic growth? You know, your thoughts on that. So I'll go um, in turn from Fiona um, uh, and on to Scott. Uh, after that, we'll um, open up for, you know, wider discussion. Um, I do want to highlight that when people are asking questions from the floor, uh, please, if you can make sure to introduce yourselves uh, so that people who are following uh, online um, know who you are. Um, so, yeah, if you can introduce yourselves and um, uh, there'll be a microphone, of course, um, like before. Uh, OK, so without further ado, uh, if we can now switch to this side of the room. Thank you. Um, Scott and uh, we have some microphones. There we go. Thank you very much. Um, so I'll sit down in a moment, but if I can. Okay. We may need to do that a little bit. Um, so, Fiona, do you want to? Yeah. Uh, hi. Um, so, I'm, I think you need to just press the on. Look, turn it on. Yeah. 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 <laughs> So I, I guess, like, I feel like I'm here as a meta-scientist. I'm, I'm a meta-scientist. That's what I do. That's what my research group does. And um, and since James has been here, he's been trying to coach me and kind of using more positive framing, and today I'm going to completely ignore that and, uh, <laughs> and talk about research waste. Um, or if you really want a positive spin, you know, improving research efficiency, I suppose, is what I've you know, where I would set my top priority. But by improving research efficiency, I don't mean just kind of speeding up the treadmill, right, of just producing more and more um, stuff. 
what I'm talking about is the avoidable waste that's in the system already. So research waste estimates in medicine are over 85% and they have been for more than two decades, um, the two decades that we've been measuring them. So this includes work that is conducted but never reported due to publication biases against negative results. It includes work that was so poorly designed to begin with that it never, um, it is, so design flaws or analysis flaws like cherry picking or pea hacking means that the findings are irreproducible. Last year's estimates from ecology, the research waste in ecology, also sit at 80%. And that you can't, you know, we might want to blame the influence of external forces like pharmaceutical companies for the research waste in medicine. We don't have that um, to explain the situation in ecology. The waste is a product of systematic problems and all the same preconditions exist in psychology, in neuroscience, in education, in biology, in economics and, and plenty of other places that I'm probably not aware of. The US Department of Defence is one example of an institution that has um, so drastically lost confidence in the social science evidence base that they've now spent tens of millions of dollars re-reviewing published articles across eight social science fields. I think this loss of confidence is, um, is real and widespread and we know that public trust is on the line. As I've said, the problems are structural. They have to do with the way we publish this selection of positive results. They have to do with the way we allocate resources, which we've heard a lot about today. Um, but what we haven't heard so much about is the bias in that resource allocation towards always novel, original, groundbreaking research, which squeezes out of the system any work that is aimed at self-correction. So any work that's aimed at replication or quality control or reanalysis, that careful checking work that is the mechanism of self-correction in science and in other fields. It's what philosophers, the work that contributes to what philosophers of science call collective objectivity, you know, object, the idea that though that sense of objectivity can't be maintained by individual researchers. It has to be a collective. The replications have to be independent. The peer review has to be independent. And in the current system, we have all but abandoned, funding agencies have all but abandoned that self-correction work. And of course, the third way is through the way we carry out research is this, this assessments, which um, James has already talked about, and that other people here like Andrea very focused on as well. Um, that third thing, research, how we measure research quality is very hard, but I think the first two aren't. You know, fixing problems in publishing and fixing problems in res resource allocation are relatively tractable problems compared to the third one. Um, and I think that's where we should be putting our efforts right now. It's actually kind of a double problem because of the, you know, Matthew Matilda effect that we're all familiar with in research funding, that we're not only resourcing the people who are already well resourced or have previously been resourced, but we're rewarding them for work that was likely the product of, the, of publication bias and other kind of selection processes of bad science as well, or bad research. Um, so it's sort of a, a double problem. I should. Thank you. Um, so I'm sure we'll come back to those. Um, yeah, in the discussion. So Matthew, if I can. Thanks, Jatha. Thanks, Fiona. Um, my name is Matthew Coners. I'm, I'm uh, from the University of New South Wales, Associate of Science and Society Network. Um, and uh, I guess that what we've been invited to do for this kind of opening kind of series of reflections is to reflect on the challenges facing Australian research policy in the context of a call for input. Uh, and I want to welcome that call, but also think about the conditions of the call. And I want to have a conversation with my SCS colleagues in the room about, about the nature of that call. And I want to reflect on what I might, what I, what I might characterise as a lost decade mm -hmm. uh, of... Uh, the relationship between research policy and STS. What do I mean by that? 
what do I mean by lost decade? So <laughs> I mean, this is a bit kind of cruel, but <laughs> he goes. Uh, I, I printed out the, the top cited papers in the journal Research Policy. That's the, the, premier, the premier journal um, of the field of research policy. And the key words are things like innovation, creativity, pathways, transitions, mode two, triple helix. My suggestion is these research policy evokes a world that no longer exists. It, it, it evokes a sense of the world that, that is a, a kind of late 1990s vision of creativity, knowledge economy, cosmopolitanism that, that has been kind of thoroughly undone in various kind of structural means. So I want to provide you two images of what that looks like, particularly from the vantage point of SDS. I sort of, this is underneath the question I asked James before. Late 1990s, early 2000s, a period of, in, of intense innovation in SDS, fighting up against science and research policy, advocating for democracy, transparency, public engagement, uh, really kind of orientated around the notion of opening the black box of sciences, research systems, research policy, uh, we're really trying to kind of get at these, these kind of wider, wider notions of conditionality and, and, and to, to kind of think about the sites in which questions of public value are being articulated and, and imagined and reimagined. So the, the, the purpose of social science in that, in, that, in, that, in that frame is not to accept the, <laughs> the, the, the ways in which questions of public value are pre-framed, but is it precisely to intervene and to reimagine what, what, those, what those concepts look like. Then we get the kind of the, the, the kind of the, the professionalization or the institutionalization of much of that thought through notions of responsible innovation. The second image I want to kind of just put put before you is, is 2020. Joe Biden, you know, end of the Trump era. We we all stand with science. <laughs> you return to re return to normality, as it were. One of his first acts as as, as president is to appoint Alondra Nelson, prominent you know, an, an amazing uh, scholar in the history of philosophy of science and STS. And to make this kind of profound statement, something that I guess we all know, that the outcomes of science, the outcomes of innovation are not, are not uh, uh, equally shared. A, a kind of a profound statement on the need to address questions of science and justice. So what we have, I guess, is, is a kind of replacement of the endless frontier narrative with, with a different kind of logic, right? So that in, implicit in, in Biden's language is, is the sense that, well, you know, so social benefit is still being produced through science, but the, but the questions are kind of downstream questions. They're about distribution. They're about making sure that's kind of equitably shared. So that kind of SDS orientation of thinking about conditionalities, thinking about the framing of problems, thinking about, about, about how questions of public value are, are, are essential to the way in which research uh, systems are, are organised is it, kind, of, kind of missing from that piece. So this is a, I guess an observation that Jack Stilgo and Shubita Bartonastro made in some of their commentary on this work. What does, that, what does that mean? I'm probably running out of time. I want to, I want to kind of think about what that means in an Australian context. So I think we uh, are hopefully at the end of this kind of decade of inaction in this space. And, and we have this kind of curious, we're in a curious moment in Australia where we inherit this kind of post, uh, post Trumpian kind of weak, like response. Like we, we stand with science as, as a kind of an indicator of, of all things that, that, that we stand against. <clears throat> But a very uneasy relationship with the outcomes of the processes of scientific and technological innovation. So take, for example, the recent debates over the AUKUS arrangement and the, and the kind of rush to insert into that discussion uh, a, 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 a kind of broader kind of research outcome. At the same time, Australia is, 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 is moving further towards a, a position on non-proliferation. This kind of this kind of uneasy sort of um, relationship with, with nuclear science. We could also cite here vaccines, AI, privacy, et cetera, et cetera. This, this kind of, this sense of there being quite, quite live questions of the public value, the public outcomes of scientific innovation processes, at the same time combined with this kind of cultural politics of innovation and science and, 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 and being, being on, on the side of science as it were. So I want to suggest a couple of things, uh, just kind of orientations for, for our discussion. I want, to, I, want to, I want to make an argument, <laughs> how do we kind of, you know, respond in, in the kind of the embers of research policy in this context. I want to think about research policy as a site for interpretive and critical SDS research 
process. So research policy is a site of co-production. So if research policy evokes a world, the question is what world is, is, is it evoking? So how is it producing a world that, that can be critically reflected upon? So, is this, so how is it a site of co-production? How is research policy as a site for, for imagining and indeed reimagining fundamental questions of public value and the, and the remaking of, 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 of what we might think of as technological democracy? So to echo kind of Brian Wynn's kind of imperative of learning late lessons from early warnings, what I want to suggest is we need to move in this discussion from a model where public value and, and social benefit are delivered by science to, to a much more kind of multi-voiced uh, articulation of, 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 the, of the policy framing of these broad questions. Probably enough for me. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. And again, I'm sure we'll pick up on those Dave, questions. Um, Tamsin. Hello, uh, I am Tamsin Peach. I'm a historian um, of the universities, and that will become clear shortly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I think I want to pick, I've been thinking a lot about different ways of warranting knowledge at the moment, particularly in the context of the 1920s, which is my special topic. But um, in the course of that uh, work, I've come back to John Dewey. And um, many of you may be familiar with John Dewey's notion of of how publics are constituted. And I just wanted to, you know, remind us all about that now. Um, he, of course, was working at American educational philosopher nearly 100 years ago in the context of um, how publics might work in a democratic society coming to grips with specialised knowledge and its implications. According to Dewey, um, publics have no a priori existence. Um, they come into being when three factors are in place. First, when the impacts of any situation or set of events are intellectually and emotionally appreciated by the various people they affect. Second, uh, so, you know, we might think about that as visibility or um, uh, the appreciation of effects. Second, when a shared interest is generated among different groups. And then third, uh, who, th when those groups take action to address and regulate, and Dewey's word is care for, uh, and attend to those impacts. The public, Dewey wrote, consists of all those who are affected by the indirect consequences of transactions to such an extent that it is deemed necessary to have those consequences systematically cared for. And uh, importantly for him, when circumstances change, so too do publics and their demands. Um, so I, I wanted to bring that today because it's important, I think, for us to think about publics and where they sit in this question of research infrastructure and what moment we're in. Uh, and that's where universities come back in. Because I think if we're to return a bit to the Stephen Chapin book that you ended on, James, which, you know, is one of my favourite um, pieces of work too, uh, research infrastructure in Australia and research policy in Australia is intimately connected to the history of universities. And that is... You know, that makes Australia relative, that's a particular condition to Australia. And I think, uh, and I want to uh, think a little bit about the particular moments, there's three, I think, that have determined the history of research policy in the 20th century. But I noticed that on your little map of, of terms that you um, surveyed to create your map, universities was not one of them. Higher education was, but universities wasn't. And I, I don't think those two things are the same thing in the kind of literature. But if we... Um, if we look back to these moments in the history of Australia, there is World War I. The beginnings of Australian's research infrastructure comes out of the First World War. Um, it creates, importantly, a new idea of the expert researcher, which requires who requires, and it is often who as opposed to uh, which, um, who requires separate funding um, from their teaching activity. So, you know, importantly, the CSIRO comes directly out of the First World War. We often think about it as coming out of 1926, later in the 1920s, but it is born in 1916 as part of the imperial uh, approach to science in the First World War. Um, of course, the NH, uh, the National Health Research Council is also mooted from the 1920s onwards. There are various state initiatives, including Victoria's Premier's Plan for, for Research, and we see the beginnings of federal funding for university research. 
So by the end of the 1920s, what we've got is the Commonwealth making key interventions to support research work on the basis that it's generating new knowledge to serve to solve problems within its constitutional remit. So public health, quarantine, particularly agriculture. Um, but the First World War is the moment that creates a public that then um, that constitutes this new research infrastructure. Then the Second World War creates another one. Uh, the Second World War produces the PhD, which in many years is 20 years too late in Australia, but, you know, it's been mooted that, that it was mooted after the First World War. Uh, it creates a PhD. It creates the ANU. It creates a series of scholarships for research um, students and for research fellowships. Uh, it expands on federal funding for research. Uh, we get a new set of research priorities. Um, and, the, uh, and ultimately in the 1950s, the beginning of triennial research funding before you get the block grant, which then allows uh, institutions to allocate research um, um, money as they see fit. Um, and then I think we could probably see that the third stage, the next moment that uh, creates a different kind of, uh, of public is the response to deindustrialization after the end of the 70s. Really, it takes up until the Dawkins reforms that, re that re reconstitute our uh, you know, higher education infrastructure. There we get the Australian Research Council, competitive grants, you know, the system that we're all kind of familiar with. And importantly, I would add in international students, which, as we know, um, became a major funding source for research in Australia. And so that messy, messy, messy embodied relationship between teaching and research becomes very uh, important from the um, 2000s onwards, turn of the century onwards. So we might come now to the current moment. Um, you know, the higher education system that we have in Australia today reflects what in Jewish terms might be thought of as the social arrangements for the care of knowledge that have been that have arisen in response to the social and economic conditions of the last 40 years. But as the university's accord process and the chief scientist call recognizes, those arrangements are no longer fit for purpose. Which is great. You know, it's great that they're finally being recognized. Uh, but I think the, um, the question falls upon us to articulate what the, 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 the drivers of the new challenge are and whether they fit Dewey's three definitions. You know, is there, does climate change, and I think climate change is, that, is, the, is, the, um, is the moment we're facing, um, does it, does the impacts of climate change, um, are they intellectually and emotionally appreciated by various people that they affect? Ah, is there a shared interest generated among different groups? And are those groups able to come together to take actions to address and care for and regulate um, our common interest in this moment? Thank you, Tamsin. And again, plenty there to come back to. Um, Robin. So my experiences are very different than the three who've spoken before me because I'm an ex-politician. I used to be in the Cabinet and I was involved in discussions at the state level, so not national, around resource allocation, including towards science and research and so I, and social science. And I'll make a few observations. I think that's the most helpful thing I can do. Firstly, I think and I could talk a long time and so I'll try and keep it brief because politicians are renowned for speaking at length. But... I'll try and be snappy, and that's something we're probably better at than we think, actually. But um, politicians generally have a utilitarian view of research and think it's about solving their problems as they identify them in relation to public policy challenges. And so that's the context into which people at the cabinet level, and I won't discuss individual cabinet decisions, approach research and scientific and social science research. It's about solving the problems in the society as identified through a democratic process. Secondly, there's a national competition or state competition element to it in an economic and social context. And that's, um, I think, was articulated by the lead speaker in part. I think also there's, and it was articulated by some of the earlier speakers, there's a divergence in the placing. I wouldn't put us in a post-Trump world. I think that's an optimism bias of an extreme kind. And I, I would differ from the last speaker in saying I think the sort of challenge of our time is authoritarianism and the consequential issues across politics of authoritarian, anti-democratic ideologies and thoughts. So the, there is not a consensus about science's role. So for large sections of the political community, not the ones I belong to, unheard 
and the contrarians running in unheard is more influential than the best scientist in whatever field. And people should grapple with that reality. And I was just struck by the sort of detailed, careful thought analysing how you would make allocations in funding and how that differs from the political process in the most extreme ways. And it's almost impossible for me, I think, to sort of fully in the time sort of grasp or, or, or outline those, how different those worlds are. I mean, politics is principally a communicative process and, and the epistemology that people are involved in because of that, if I try and simplify it, and again, I'll try and be brief, is around the utility of ideas insofar as they lead to success within political debates and resolutions, often electoral. So those biases come to those processes, you know, if I'd be sort of honest about it. And so and the other thing I'd say coming out of COVID as an observation is I think this has accelerated a delegitimation of science. The, the, there was an, a sort of a, a period of the sort of elevation of a scientific approach within the discourse, in the political discourse, and the collapse of strategies based on those. And I, I think that complex and good ideas, and I think there's sort of a lot of post facto analysis with information and, in fact, empirical realities about how the virus worked at different times, which led to those sort of collapses of, 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 of processes has led to an acceleration of a distrust and a sort of a push towards an anti-science bent and an anti-social science bent. So um, I think there's a contest of the very value of science and social science and, and the sort of systems of knowledge and their legitimacy is in a process of collapse, if I'd sort of be that dramatic. And so it's not a complete collapse, but for large sections of the society and large sections of political actors, there is a collapse. And, and, and so this is a much more existential set of crises. And the other last comment I'd make, and I'll try and there's so many things that could be said, I think the nature of the existential nature of political debates and the shift towards great power competition and a whole series of other things that are happening in the world mean that from a political actor's perspective, there will be an increasing desire to see science and social science as responding to needs of both the political process and the nation. And I think it would be naive to think otherwise. Thank you. Um, so I can see, um, yeah, Robin, very, very pro provocative comments there. And um, in a way, drawing attention to the existential crisis <coughs> uh, within which this discussion about research priorities and research systems um, needs to be situated. I think it's a really useful reminder. Um, Fiona, so what we're going to do is we'll take a few responses. I'm going to open it up. Um, I think there's so much to discuss here. Um, but Fiona, I saw your hand go up. So um, yeah, do you want to respond just to that? I just wanted to um, just spend this a second on that kind of crisis point, because it's something that happens it happens to us in meta science if you if you're in the business of criticizing scientific practice there's a lot of um, pushback I've had very angry and abusive um, letters and emails telling me that that the work I'm doing is giving ammunition to climate deniers to anti-vaxxers and um, and that's you know that's a real line that I think we straddled in meta science we've obviously landed on the side that you know, showing the public the work that we are doing in investing in self-correction mechanisms is is the right way to go. That that's how we will win back public trust to say, look, we're we're doing this to fix peer review. We're doing this to fix the replication crisis and so on. That rather than sort of covering up those problems. Anybody else on the panel wants to respond to? Robin's provocation, because in a way, Matt, I'm looking at you because um, on the one hand, you have highlighted the importance of sort of going back to those uh, agendas for democratization of science, priorities, you know, which is part of the discussion really that informs the panel. Um, and yet you have, um, yeah, this view that actually that Robin has summarized that actually we don't have the political space in a way to have the um, a, that conversation. 
Yeah, thanks, Jeff. I mean, I, I, the only thing I would just walk out a little bit would be the word backward. I think we need to be be, be crafting a, a, a sense of what scientific and technological democracy looks like going forward. Just, just to highlight a couple of points. I mean, my point before was that conversations around research policy are, are imagining a cosmopolitan world, right? And if we are, whether we like it or not, entering a world of great power politics, um, where questions of national interest take on a very different kind of hue, uh, that, that necessarily changes, I think, the space and the kind of context for these, for these kind of discussions. So um, I'm not a geopolitics person, <laughs> but, I, but I do think that there are important voices that we need, and, and a plurality of voices that we need to prioritise for how we shape questions about the, the nature of the nation in this particular moment. So the, the, the sense that we can just, in a sense, persist with uh, a, a kind of model of research policy and its kind of place within the, the architecture of government that's sort of set in the late 1990s is, I think, the, the challenge I'm trying to put forward. Robin, did you want to respond to that? And Tamsin, I'll come to you in a moment. Well, I, I have great empathy for those who are seeking to improve the methodology of scientific and social science inquiry in the context where their, their work will be appropriated by disingenuous actors. I mean, that's an incredibly difficult you know, path to trod. I think the point that was being made about the need to create something for the future, I think, is really germane. You know, it, 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 there's no better yesterday. You know, it is my view, so politically and socially, there's no better yesterday to be created. So having a new, and I'm not, not a sort of, I think synthesis is a, sort of a, a very difficult sort of concept in the current circumstances because so much is contested. Almost, you know, the tool of reductum to ad absurdum that's used in politics and political discourse at the moment is so powerful. So the slightest nuance can be used to destroy an argument in the public discourse. That, which is based on empirical evidence, which is overwhelming, is sort of a, is a shocking element to the dis political discussion, I think, for people who are, tr who are trained in academia. Um, so I think creating the space where those anti-science uh, ideas and anti-sort of intellectual ideas really can be overcome and, a and there can be a consensus around a hierarchy of knowledge is, is, is in terms of science policy, I think, the question, you know, and the rest of it is sort of secondary. And sort of I, I'm not denigrating any of the work because I found it really interesting what was being presented and seemed really rational and interesting and sort of a, a, an enlightening presentation. But I, I fear unless people are responding to the existential threat and being aware of the existential threat and the very disingenuous nature of the actors who are working to delegitimate research and ideas that conflict with their political philosophies, um, you know, so much can be lost without people being aware. So I just, in, I just plead with you to be cognizant of your foes because you do have foes, I assure you. You all have people who are determined to delegitimate the work that you do almost exclusively um, and just be aware of their actions because if you're acting in a self-referential world outside of that, discourse and outside of that challenge, you will lose. You know, the, the purveyors of disinformation are winning as of now. You know, so it's uh, no one should labour under the misapprehension that reason is triumphant. That's why I sort of take it in for you in the post-Trump world. I mean, if you look at the levels of disinformation and the levels of people's belief in things that are patently untrue, that hasn't slowed down. So. Um, you literally have a, a plurality of a society, a majority of one political party supporters believing the things that are patently of, or untrue, which go to the very heart of whether you can have a democratic society in the world's largest democracy. You know, so I think we should not um, not be sanguine about the challenge and everything you should do. If I give you a piece of political advice as a political actor or a political actor, I should say, it's just be cognizant of those threats. Because it's real and it's on. Can I just say one thing? I mean, in why you answered my question, because I don't think those three conditions are present for climate change for the reasons that you you outline, and that brings us to questions of how we warrant our, like the different ways of warranting knowledge claims. We share one way of warranting knowledge claims, but there are other very potent mechanisms out there, and uh, 
yeah, and uh, constituting different kinds of publics. I, I can't resist, so I'm going to open it up in a moment, but um, Robin, I can't resist sort of maybe raising the question, um, is it the case that, you know, there have always been through history, people who believed all sorts of things, um, and in a way that's not new. Um, what's maybe new is the capacity for certain kinds of beliefs to, you know, spread um, because of new technologies and so forth. Um, but yeah, perhaps there's a question to think about, um, which is, you know, how do we, despite people's beliefs, um, you know, how do we sort of work together um, so that the system doesn't fall apart, if you like, because um, we have done it in the past, if you see what I mean. Yeah, think, think about, yeah. If you want me to respond to it, so I don't yeah. want to monopolize. Um, I've been the most provocative, so that tends, that's part of the problem. The more provocative you are, the more likely you are to monopolise debate in our current discourse, and that's part of the issue. Um, and perhaps unconsciously, that's what I just did. Um, so I think, I think yes, I'm not saying that the die is cast and that irrationality and fear and, uh, and the sort of tropes around authoritarianism will dominate the human civilization from here on in I think there's a very live contest um and one that's but I do think I mean I talked to very intelligent conservative journalists um not as much as I once used to and literally they're reading unheard and picking up you know tropes from contrarian intellectuals who make a business of sort of critiquing the the mainstream knowledge and that's the norm you know so um, how do you, I think these these matters, I think there's a limit, and I think we're seeing this in the UK, if I'd be more optimistic, on some of these ideas because if an idea doesn't work and if it is dysfunctional and if it harms the society, and I could go into an idea around economics, and so ideas around economics that are sort of falling and falling, the process of falling apart in the UK, that are populist, um, then the legitimacy of the system of those ideas comes into complex. So these are not... Ten foot tall ideas that to, to miss to to miss to 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 pull together analogies in, inappropriately, but if these are not unbeatable sets of, of, of ideas, and the knowledge based on empirical evidence and rational thought and self examination and critique has a much more powerful underlying likelihood of being successful ultimately. So there are strengths in the world that's represented in this room, which the critics, by their very nature, can't draw upon. So, so, I, so that's not. So, if I'd argue, it's not as if science will disappear or social science will disappear. But I think there is a threat, and I think the threat is very serious, and I think it should be, and this is my political biases, but it should be defeated, uh, that threat, and and there should be a synthesis and a re-establishment of the legitimacy of inquiry based on reason and evidence in a hierarchy of knowledge for the benefit of the community. But it's a complex problem. And I, we haven't touched upon AI or the tech world or surveillance capitalism or dataism and all the other sort of issues that are bubbling away, which I think are existential as well. So um, well, we've only touched on them very briefly, one of the speakers did. But so I think you know, people just have to be alive to the nature of the discourse in the society and the threat to the society. And I, I'm confident that if they are, if, when I say they, you and others, uh, then they, then the people can respond because the tools that you are utilising for all their flaws, and I accept there are replication crises and all those things, are much more likely to produce efficacious responses than populist authoritarian responses. Tam, Tamsin, did you want to um, respond, elaborate a little bit on your, I think you said earlier, um, about this goes back to the question of how knowledge claims are warranted, but also how you get publics to um, uh, care about um, particular forms of knowledge, um, yeah, and attend to their impacts. So did you want to respond to that? And then I'm going to open it up for questions. Uh, th thank you for, um, for that. Um, I've just written a book about the 1920s and how a how universities come to have authority over knowledge, uh, growing out of a set of circumstances that are not necessarily dissimilar to the ones that we're in now. And in that, I wanted to attend to the competing ways that 
universities employed forms of, sorry, the, the different forms of warranting knowledge that universities drew on in the 1920s and how expertise won in that conflict. <laughs> uh, there were other ways, that experiential ways, that, you, that, were, that were a key part of how universities functioned up until the mid-1920s that were displaced by a kind of specialised knowledge that, um, that has reigned for the 20th century. And so in my other work uh, as um, in the Centre for Public History, I've been trying to think about how we might return forms of experiential warrant to um, how knowledge functions in public. And the podcasting stuff I've done, um, and I'm running a big sort of um, studio now at UTS um, that is thinking about audio and visual media as, as part of the research process, um, is an attempt to experiment with different forms of knowledge warrants um, that aren't just about um, the authority of expertise. But we might also think of other forms of warranty knowledge, of course. There's faith, there's, <laughs> there's, there's um, direct experience of different kinds, um, and there's also charismatic knowledge, charismatic performance, charisma, um, amongst many others. But the, Anyway, I think one of the challenges for us as a research community and as people doing meta science is to bring them into our analyses. Um, yeah. Can I add one? one yeah, sure. Problem? And it's to go back to the 1930s yeah. uh, rather than the 1920s. Uh, so, have all of you heard of Lynn Mitchell, writer of the Silver Brumby series? This is a kind of this is an obscure reference, right? She writes this amazing book on soil conservation. They're kind of the the birth of the Australian soil conservation movement. It's reviewed by a geologist here, here in Melbourne at the, within the School of Geology at, at Melbourne University, who writes this um, incredibly dismissive review saying, this, this book's wonderful, it's a bit of pop science, but the real work is done by real men mm. in universities. Mm. So expertise wins by reasserting a certain figure of expertise in a particular kind of ways. So we're familiar with that logic, right? So... The kind of the the kind of poppy stuff is outside the university, and, and but it's it's the real work of the real expertise, and there's so much is we we know that so much is lost when we when we when we align ourselves with a particular kind of sense of what what warranting expertise kind of means. I'm I'm a, I'm a boy from Bankstown. That's that's a suburb in Western Sydney. Paul Keating was my uh, was my the, the the politician I grew up with. Paul Keating is someone that we've been hearing a little bit uh, <laughs> of like. A, a, a thinker of great powers. He had this kind of, I mean, so I, I, I'm inspired by Bokke in lots of ways. He, he, his reflection on the, on the, on the post-Cold War period, I think, is quite astute. He said that the, the US and the Clinton administration luxuriated in the, in the IT bubble and then allowed, in a sense, the, 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 the conditions that, that we see today kind of emerging in, in, in geopolitically. My, my, my suggestion is that STS, uh, research policy and, and kind of social science, also luxuriated in the, in, in the context of, of the IT bubble, in the sense that we, we, we were comfortable with, with the world that was being created by science and we were kind of coming along alongside that. So what, what happens then is, is, a, is a kind of set of critiques about directionality, about purposes, about publics in that context. And we... Think about, say, uh, you know, the GM debates in, in, in Europe, for example. So the, the, the critiques of unreason that were being made, I'm thinking of particular kind of organisations uh, that James knows about, like Dick Duverne, et cetera, writes a book called The March of Unreason, were being directed at STS people that were, that were integrally involved in, in, in questioning the directionality of, of science and, 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 and kind of research. Skip forward 20 years, that, 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 whole, that whole arrangement is flipped and we're, we're kind of, Worried about these kind of this kind of uh, anti-science, authoritarian so, so sorts of agendas. So the question for me is, in that context, what what is the conditions of a response that might be that might be be generated through kind of critical social science perspectives? So do do we need to kind of in a sense return to a kind of kind of figure of the expert, the real men in the real universities? Clearly, that's not what we're aiming towards here, right? So clearly what, what, we, what we need is, is a kind of plurality of expertise to respond to, to this current moment. So not, not, not to be kind of naive about the moment we're in, but, 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 to, but to promote a plurality of entryways into that context. Thank you. Thanks, Matt. Um, 
Wow. Okay. Lots to chew on. Um, I want to try and bring us back, if possible, in the questions uh, from the floor, to the uh, the call from the chief scientist office um, to contribute to the setting of research priorities. And I think, yeah, in many ways, what we've heard connects to that. Um, but let me open up um, to the floor and also online for um, any questions, responses um, on those. Uh, question in the back there. Do I need a microphone? Or? Yeah, I can, I can pass that. Um, and if you can say who you are for the benefits of people um, online in particular, they can't see you. Um, my name is Martin. I am a PhD student at Deakin in education. Um, I was originally going to respond in part to some of the things from this morning. I'll try to link it to this debate and the, and the question. Um, one thing that came up is the, the idea of randomized allocation. And I was reminded of this famous quote about Wall Street of a, a blindfolded monkey throwing a dart at a dartboard is, has a better chance of picking a winning portfolio than an, uh, an expert. And um, to take this a little bit seriously, like Merton's sort of norm of universe, I, I just read up on it, universalism talks about taking multiple, everybody's knowledge claims uh, equally seriously. And so this remind, this puts me in mind of like two things. One is the idea of humility. The other one is the idea of sort of decentralizing, which also came up this morning. And it occurs to me that in light of this debate about authoritarianism, that both on the left and the right for very different reasons, there are people wanting to go towards decentralization and there's people wanting to go towards centralization. And they have very different views on that, but there might be some room for a concilia a reconciliation there. <clears throat> so my question, I guess, is if you see any room for both of those things, for humility, for decentralization, and maybe, yeah, not to uh, go, you know, to re refuse the fight or the challenge of the fight that was put to us, but maybe to circumvent it a little bit. <clears throat> Thank you. I'm going to collect a few questions before I turn back to the panel. So the question there about uh, decentralization and the uh, hopes, if you like, for decentralization yeah, in this in responding to this moment. Um, Thank you. Um, other other questions, comments. Jeff, that there's one, one yeah. online. Thank you. Uh, sorry, I don't have a microphone. Uh, Contam this is for Tamsin. Please expand on. Uh, thank you. <laughs> there's a question from Libby online for Tamsin uh, to please expand on experiential warrants for knowledge in pre 1920s universities, including if or how it relates to teaching. Is there a link between research for public good, whatever that is? and research who engage with publics through forums like teaching. And Libby is a PhD student at Sydney Law School, researching personal data government. Yes, sir. Can you just talk a little bit in the middle? Sorry, yep. Uh, is there a link between research for public good, whatever that is, and researchers who engage with publics through forums like teaching? Okay. Tamsin, if you can just hold on to that. Um, one more question and I'll come back to the panel. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, just if you know, we've got a crisis of democracy in, in terms of the national research priorities, how do we get social sciences into those priorities? Uh, because you know, generally we're we're not part of seen as part of the big picture. And, and if we're looking at plurality, which we obviously have to do, but there's, you know, I guess it's a little bit between the centralised and decentralised. There's a you know, hierarchy of knowledge that supposedly universities uh, might contain. And then there's the reality that there's commercial interests, there's uh, civil society organisations, there's um, think tanks, um, there's all these other sources that are both legitimately uh, you know, contributing to research and knowledge and are also trying to, a vested interest, you know, going both ways. Sorry, yet again, I had two questions. Thank you. Um, so, Tamsin, I might ask you to respond to that specific question before I um, ask others in the panel to pick up on those two questions. 
Um, thank you to Lydia. <laughs> um, <clears throat> um, uh, universities drew on, um, particularly in the United States, uh, on, on on direct forms of experience uh, in, in the in the subject I'm re researching, particularly of travel and of. Um, it was the growth of kind of international studies actually arose from the growth of mass tourism. Um, so direct ex, uh, experiences of, of traveling the world uh, became pushed out as international studies and uh, international relations emerged as a, as a disciplinary field. Uh, that's the short version of that story. Um, but there's lots of other, in other disciplinary contexts, ways that took place. But I think um, the broader answer to your question, Lydia, particularly about um, public good and publics is linked to Martin, Martin's question um, about decentralization and humility. And I think the, well, I think one of the virtues of, um, of decentralization is that it enables relationship building. And that is a different way of warranting knowledge claims, the personal direct experience. You know, if I think about my father, who was a farmer, I uh, didn't go to university, um, <clears throat> his father was a farmer in the Western Districts of Victoria, uh, near Horsham, his first, in, his father's in the 1930s, first encounter with expertise or primary encounter with expertise was through the guy from um, uh, ISI, is that what it was called, uh, who came and talked to him about soil. And uh, he listened to that advice and many of his other contemporaries did not listen to his advice and as a consequence his wheat won all the prizes. Right? But that was a... Um, because of the nature of how imperial, what's it called, imperial, I see, I see, I chemical industries. Because of the nature of how that was structured, um, there was direct connection between the sales guy all the way up to the research lab. And I think teaching is a little bit the same. That everybody has the experience of school, primary school teaching. You know, what are the public institutions that link direct experience, relational experience on the grounds of people's daily lives? all the way up to research activity. And what marketization and um, outsourcing has done is chop up those things. Huh. And, um, and I think we, have, we haven't understood the cost of that because one of the costs of it is that there aren't the sites to constitute publics around forms of knowledge through relationship that is linked to expertise. Uh, so I think decentralization has the seeds in it of recapturing some of that, and that goes back to um, the question online too, I think. Thank you. Fiona, um, I don't know if you want to pick up on the question about decentralization and humility. I'm sure that's a theme in um, matter science. Yeah, but more the humility aspect of that question, actually, sort of, uh, and what that might mean in practice. So this is something that we're thinking about now as we try and reimagine how peer review might work and how we can um, include a diverse, uh, a more diverse pool of people in reviewing research and allowing those people to interact during that peer review or research evaluation phase. I think there are some really, you know, very practical things that could that could um, build humility not only in the inquiry but in evaluation as well. Perhaps I could jump on the question about how the social science aspects of national research policy setting, um, which I guess is what do what you want us to talk about. <laughs> I, <laughs> I do, please. Um, so to me, like, well, what's, what's, the, what's the problem and what, what's the challenge of national research policy setting? So I think there's a couple of problems that I see. Firstly, I think national priority setting in Australia has been a little bit back of envelope. So we get these kind of, hey, big ideas, let's all kind of agree on these kind of things we can, you know, note down in the back of an envelope. And it's kind of a little bit set and forget, right? Sort of, hey, you know, big ideas and then that then kind of some degree shapes um, research kind of cultures and all the rest of it. And then a little bit of special pleading from, you know, particular kind of areas of research, you know, like, hey, this body of research can, can address climate change. Like, of course we all, of course that's the case, right? At the same time, you know, the national <laughs> research priorities at, at a time when we're, I think, increasingly unsure of what, what, is, what constitutes our nation in, in quite fundamental ways. So we, we are, you know, we're, we're, we're living in a, in, a, in a profound period of thinking and rethinking the 
the nature of our nation in, in, in important ways. And uh, you know, I come from a perspective of wanting to see that 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 questioning of the nation as a central part of what our nationhood could mean, for example. So, in that context, you know, the things we can, I think we can kind of promote, right? So. I'd love to see a, a kind of sense of national priority setting is a conversation about priorities <laughs> rather than a kind of set and forget kind of kind of kind of task, and actually a, a, a policy capability to actually can continue to to ask and re-ask and explore with with diverse range of inputs the nature of that priority setting process. So it's a much more kind of uh, open-ended kind of process rather than a kind of uh, let, let's kind of arrange them in 2023 and that will, that will shape the next couple of years. And I'd love you know, just to kind of <laughs> end with a sense of um, the donation is never one thing, right? Mm. And so that, that sense of the multiplicity of donation and the donation is comprised of, uh, fundamentally comprised of, of plural, plural publics uh, needs, I think, to be reflected in how we uh, 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 compose our policy arrangements around that, those kind of policy Thank you. Robert, did I you? Just, yeah, I just want to say something about social policy and responding to equality because to put it into the sort of, sort of uh, I mean, I don't particularly want to labour the point on authoritarianism, but the failure with globalisation and change, and I think we're living through a period of extraordinary change, like extraordinary change in society, um, to respond in a way that that gave the ideas in the society and the, and the discussions within the society to respond to the inequalities of the, of the consequences of those changes has been at the heart of the sort of problems I've alluded to. So I think there is no response without social science having a more effective response to those issues and, and that being front and centre of a strategy at a national level of research is from a political perspective. And so I think... People who are in the social sciences should not be shy. I know there's a discussion of humility, but I'll give you a top tip. Don't be too humble when asking for money from politicians. That's a, that's a mistake. Right? Um, uh, but uh, but the, 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 there's nothing more important than the work that social science can do. There's no... The problems that I'm alluding to, and uh, you know, and there is a... I don't particularly want to dominate the conversation further because I think I was perhaps too much the provocateur today, but... Um, is is there should be a real confidence and a self confidence of the of the importance of the work that's undertaken by social scientists and the need for multidisciplinary work, the need for different perspectives, the need for responding to those challenges, be because I have a view that change is not slowing down. So the sort of consequential issues of rapidity of change and what that means for a democratic society is in stopping. And the distributional questions have been to go to the bubble question of sort of tech. I think we're completely ignored for a period, not completely, but largely ignored. So please have confidence in yourselves. I couldn't emphasise it enough. Please look to your own work and the contribution that you can make and the ideas and try and inform the research policy as it's developed because the, you, your work is critically needed. And I was being provocative in a sense because of my deep belief that scientists and social scientists need to inform the discourse. Thank you. Question at the back. Thank you. Hi, everybody. My name is Cynthia Fellini. I'm from the School of Medicine here at Deakin. My work's in bioethics, so prioritization, that's core business of concepts, principles, stakeholders. And I love this idea of resetting priorities to reflect our nation, but to me, there are a couple of tracks that are all running at different speeds, and that's development of science, technology, it's the um, kind of pushing the applications of it, which sometimes can be really early and sometimes are delayed. And there's also, as we heard before, about how slowly um, funding structures, government decisions can or cannot happen. So how do we reconcile, how do we hold space for all of these three different tracks when um, there's a push for application, but also sometimes to me a feeling that we just kind of need to press pause if we're gonna do this kind of deep thinking about you know, what are our priorities and how does that set us up as a nation? So how do we kind of all work together on that massive project, you know, in five minutes? <laughs> Any, a little less than five minutes, maybe. <laughs> Sorry. 
Um, I mean, my my answer would be we have to be really sure that we're investing in self correction, so we can you know we can go at whatever speed we want, but there needs to be you know ten percent of funding set a, set aside by every funding agency to make sure they're funding replications and reanalysis and doing that quality control work. Um, I mean, ideally, it would be more than that, but there has to be like we need to invest in the things that are going to self correct the process when it's especially when it's running at light speed and we're not we're just not investing in, in those things right now. We're not investing in replication. We're not investing in peer review. We're not investing properly in how we, you know, assess research metrics, except for James, he's doing but um, you know, they they we're just not investing in this in that self correction stuff. I just oh, want yeah, to, sorry. to build on some of the earlier remarks, thinking about I guess public good and publics, but also the the idea of inequalities within the research sphere. Sorry, so, can I, I remind you to uh, introduce yourself? Oh, sorry, my name is Vivian Durand. I work as a postdoctoral fellow at the Alfred Deakin Institute. Uh, so my concern is about the kind of world, or the question is what kind of world is the world of research modelling? So how inclusive is that model for people? Um, what kind of world are we living in as researchers? Are we running, rushing to prove our worth constantly? Yes. Um, what's that, what does that say about the space for deep thinking and, again, these ideas of all these tracks running at once? How can we make sense of a profoundly unjust and equal world when we're reinforcing it through the systems that we are working within? So what can we do to shift those systems so they really are reflective of the kind of world we want um, that do take into account the lived experiences of researchers of all kinds? I think we really need to think about adjusting those to include more perspectives in the world of research if we want to welcome people into that space and not because like I think the points that Robin was making earlier about conspiracy are very real. Where does conspiracy come from? There are kernels of truth underlying conspiracy. How do we create the conditions so that those who might buy into some conspiracies actually are ready to engage with the world of research? How can we engage with people who may be disengaged? And I think there's a real reason why people are disengaged, including researchers themselves. I want, can I add a question? Thank you. Because you're collecting. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, so I was just thinking, uh, you know, again, trying to get back to the priorities uh, thing, uh, thinking that there are two things here. One is kind of, you know, the context within which substantive strands of, you know, um, research or topics of research might be important. So that's one thing, you know, where we find like this. Um, usually we find social science is not at all reflected in, this, in the research priorities in, in Australia. Um, anything international is not reflected in, in, in research priorities in Australia and so on. So that's one, one strand of it. But I think related to that is the work on research systems uh, or, you know, uh, you know, I'm very excited to hear actually about, you know, you said at least two things are things that we can work on. One being, you know, how we publish and the second being uh, how we fund. And so there are possibilities, you know, of intervening in the system itself that that might actually have some legs that, you know, so the, and the two, of course, are linked because, you know, what we research is largely determined by, you know, kind of research priorities and, and the systems and, and, and how the system works in terms of arranging priorities and arranging allocation of funding and so on. So I'm just thinking about, you know, um, and, and Robin, I think, raised the idea of the context, you know, within which all this is happening. So in the terms of reference and so on, you know, the questions that I like, what, what should, you know, what should we prioritize, et cetera, there's no sense of the moment, you know. I mean, that could have been, you know, 10 years ago, the same set of kind of context might have been, you know, blandly set. It could have, it doesn't reflect particularly probably the current issues or things that we should be, terribly exercised about. Um, and so I'm just thinking about how do we, so if you're trying to think of, you know, the contextual issue of the, you know, moment in history, uh, the moment for Australia as a nation, as, as a kind of a plurality of people and, and you know, the, the whole emphasis on decoloniality that, that we are now, you know, kind of really, uh, it's coming to the fore now in every, in every forum that, that we're at including, you know, decolonizing data, datafication and, and data processes. And so given all of that, how do we then, you know, um, what, how can we as a group here think of uh, setting those, uh, advice or, you know, responding to that call for new priorities? Um, so that it goes beyond um, identifying individual topics, but actually speaks to the whole system. Exactly, yeah. 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 Thank you, Radhika. Um, anybody wants to have a go? 
at that point. Wow, I mean that's that's a broad set of set of oh, it's a broad set of uh, questions and concerns. Uh, I, I think these questions are a little bit easier when there's more research money in the system. Right. So, so first thing, we should make an argument for the value of yeah. public research funding, and everyone in this room is going to cheer for that. Uh, but let me say, let me say a kind of something after that. So there's, a, there's a wonderful book by Michael Hart called Forged Consensus. It's an analysis of the NSF, and it's a kind of it's a repudiation of the endless frontier narrative. He basically makes the argument that, that research funding allocations in the US are are a kind of consensus between competing fields of research, basically special pleading. Between physics, chemistry, biology, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So that that's the kind of rail politique of, of, of research funding and, and, and research policy. So the question for us is: we, we should argue for more public funding of research, but we should we should also be arguing for the for the conditions under which that's that's that, that, that's that's articulated and and the kind of alliances that that, that that form underneath that umbrella. So take for example the last. Kind of you know two weeks we had this profound discussion about you know Australia's kind of becoming a nuclear nuclear powered that nation all of a sudden without you know, the hint of really much public debate and very quickly you know key figures in the scientific community were really quite quick to to kind of attach themselves to the nuclear agenda to say hey you know my field can do all this wonderful work for this this new nuclear agenda. Well, you know, policymakers, people in the bureaucracy understand that dynamic. They understand the, the, the kind of the way in which science engages in this special pleading, particularly in, 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 the, in, the, in the way fields compete with and some, of, to some degree align themselves with each other. So we need to kind of build on that, on that sensibility. This is a really profound discussion, I think, and, and the sense that uh, we as social scientists, I'm assuming many of us as social scientists here, see in national priority settings some profound questions of public value, some profound questions of, of, of kind of democracy. There's something really encouraging. We should kind of uh, continue to build this conversation. And lastly, to come back to James's point, you know, the, this sense of kind of, you know, this potential in Australia abandoning all of this sort of science policy kind of architecture to kind of an algorithm is, is a, is a I mean, James has, I think, asked us a really profound question around that, right? We have an opportunity in, in Australia right now to build a research policy architecture for the, the, the for our nation in 2023 and, and and beyond. And I think we should seize an opportunity. And then there's an opportunity here to really build that afresh. And I think it's a, it's a, it's a, there's lots of conditionalities around that, but I think there's an opportunity there. Thank you. Any Anybody else on that question of um, research priority setting uh, or inputs into research priority setting being more than identifying topics and really kind of speaking to these system issues. In, does any, any anybody want to jump in on that? I don't want to say anything. The University's Accord discussion paper does, it doesn't talk about the emerging world of great power politics, but it does actually do a pretty good job of identifying other aspects of our moment. And I wonder if those two discussion papers can be triangulated a bit more in a response. Um, it's particularly interesting around climate. Um, one of the, well, the only thing it says about climate really is that we need experts to find technical, technical solutions. And, you know, I would say one of the social science responses, and this is what the historians are going to say, is that democratic deficit and democratic health is a, going to be a, a primary and necessary response to climate threat and the experiences of climate threat. And so you can bring these two things together in uh, in a way that neither of those documents does. Um, I can go on, but I'll yeah. <laughs> Anybody else on that question before I do another final round of um, inviting questions from the floor or online? Any other questions online? Yeah. Yeah. Emma, I see your hand. Um, yeah, so I thought I'd just do a, a bit of a devil's advocate for some of the issues that we're discussing. Um, so does it, in terms of, like, disinformation um, and, you know, lack of falling falling apart of trust in science, I mean, we've saw, we saw that how um, research funding or research and innovation funding is, has continued to increase. So does it matter that 
you know, the general public, that we don't have a public. Um, some things, you know, will just be funded and continue to be funded, you know, whether or not there's, you know, public, there's, there's a public response. I mean, when we had a previous government that was very, a federal government that was very, um, you know, hostile towards particularly the humanities and social sciences, they, you know, they picked off a few ARC projects to <laughs> ban and make fun of. Um, but that was, you know, that's not, that, that could do a lot worse. So, you know, short of, of having an authoritarian government ourselves, which I think would not be good, um, does that really make any difference? That's my first question. And my other kind of devil's advocate around, say, research priorities is it, I mean, it is, on one hand, it is a profound kind of expression of what the nation is. On the other hand, it's just, you know, it is a bunch of words and there's going to be like health and well-being, there's going to be equity, and then the social sciences will kind of try and you know, insert ourselves into these little hand-waving words that say society is important. So does someone want to, you know, make me feel less cynical about those things? <laughs> Um, Emma's, yeah, very pro provocative um, question there. Yeah, anyone wants to have a go at that one? Does it matter if there's public warrant um, for these well, priorities? I mean, I think I don't think I'm the right person to help with this. Actually, I feel I feel kind of the the same way. I mean, my you know, my my main concern is that the evidence base for whatever it is for whatever that is the basis of is is reliable isn't that um and and some you know something that can inform environmental management or political decision making or whatever kind of action we're looking to take so i mean i don't know it's i, I don't know <laughs> i just remind people of what happened with JobKeeper. And universities. <laughs> so, so, you know, the political and social context really does matter. Yes. So, so, so it's sort of like, you know, and, um, you know, that, that happened for reasons. The people, and a lot of people lost their jobs. Yeah. And then Josh lost his seat. Josh. I mean, I, I I went to an amazing talk by Noel Pearson at the weekend and um, one of the things he asked us to imagine was what our country looks like if a no vote gets up. Um, there is no backwards, right? We're now in a national, well, there's two parts for <laughs> that we're not going to go back to no vote. Um, and that's not the same science policy at all, but... Um, the outcome of a national conversation will really be important to how the conversation about who we are as a nation can can, can travel in different directions. And I think the same thing applies in different ways to, to, to science and research and our knowledge institutions more broadly, which include libraries and, you know, ways that publics can access knowledge. Keep babies out of libraries. <laughs> Go into a library now and screaming kids. <laughs> my, my kids are not babies, but they still scream. Um, <laughs> it's a teenage thing. Um, <laughs> but then I go to libraries. <laughs> let's let's pivot. Um, uh, a, a couple of thoughts, right? So let, let me take you to a uh, let me take you to a really specific location in the world. I, I do work on climate transition in the Hunter Valley, right? The issue in that space is not public agreement with prep propositions around climate change. It's the form of the transition, right? The New South Wales government is, you know, is, is bringing, and it's a whole set of debates about decommissioning, large, you know, coal-fired power stations and, and commissioning of new renewables and storage facilities, and then the legacy issues of environmental injustice in that place, right, the sort of coal ash contamination, right? So the, the, if, if we tell ourselves the primary, the primary research objective is a kind of, is a kind of sense of public distrust in science, we miss really uh, significant bits of what's actually sort of happening and the, and the kind of the form of the transition we are part of, right? And we don't see that as a, as a matter of profound kind of social and democratic 
involvement, right? We, we see it as a kind of a, as a as a technological pathway rather than as a as a sociological kind of kind of story. So yeah, so I mean, I, I, research policy is of course kind of words, right? But it can be much more than that. I think. I think one of the one of the challenges I, I, I think we we have in Australia is to is to see this. But we're both SDS people, right? To to see the, these kind of these kind of policy kind of arrangements as as really sites where the nature of our technological democracy, our democracy in twenty twenty three, is being imagined and potentially reimagined, right? So in a sense, what I'm kind of trying to argue for is for SDS people to kind of be interested <clears throat> in in these kind of words and and the worlds that they're creating, right? Because if we're not interested, we 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 kind of we just ignore them, and then actually those worlds are created for us. Thank you, Matt. Um, I might just jump on that exchange and also build on a, a question from the floor that came earlier, and try and articulate something maybe for the final five minutes or so that we have. Um, so I think point was made earlier that um, you know what are the kinds of worlds that are being imagined or modeled in research? Is it more injustice, more inequality, or is it something, Matt, as you were saying, you know, something that could be, in fact, more transformative than that? Um, so that words like equity aren't just words that have to feature in uh, any kind of policy statement, um, let alone, you know, research policy. Um, so I guess I'm wondering if, it, what, yeah, is it possible to articulate or how could we articulate um, inputs into research priority setting um, where equality or greater addressing inequality, if you like, um, is actually central um, to what is being imagined by research. It's not just something that happens afterwards, after the fact. So first you develop the technology or indeed the social science, right? Um, and then something will follow, which is maybe addressing inequality. Um, yeah, is there a way, can we imagine, can we articulate um, the embedding of uh, greater equality into the research uh, system and its relationship to social benefit, public value and so forth? Um, can I ask each of you maybe to respond to that? <laughs> so too hard. <laughs> But can we articulate it in a way that actually it's not an optional extra? It's not just to work. I mean, yeah, I think that's a very provocative question, uh, a point there, uh, Emma, that we see these words like equity, which we can then attach ourselves to, right? Like, yeah, I can do that. Um, but for it to be more meaningful, for equity to be more meaningful, what would it take in the kind of research system? I'll respond with a question. Who is best placed to know what the problems are that we're trying to address? I think often experts come thinking they are the best place to define the problems and then they can provide the solutions. But your work in The Hunter and many other people's participatory research suggests that we're often very far off with our definition of the problem. I'm trying not to be the provocateur at every occasion, but I'll say one more thing. Um, to take, we just had the shadow of COVID. So if you're in the bottom quintile, you're more than three times more likely to die. I don't, like that's not, that's an example of how equity isn't a factor in what we discuss in the society. So it's sort of like there's a fair amount to go over is the observation to make. You know, we're not at some utopia where equity is sent front and centre in how public policy and social issues are discussed in the society. And that's sort of like that's, and it's, oh, I'll well, give another one. If you were born in the Middle East, I think you're nearly four times more likely to die. Um, and so you know, the, the, the idea that equity is at the centre of our public discourse, I think is problematic and in, in, in our research world in itself. So that's a pretty interesting place to be so talking about research policy. I think the shadow of COVID will be something that we will need to reflect on um, 
in quite some depth. I think there's profound things we need to learn from that experience and, uh, uh, and the way in which our science policy and science communication kind of kind of wins of government in both in, in all the major states kind of performed in that context and, and effectively enabled the outcomes that um, that we saw in the suburbs I grew up in. So I don't want to necessarily uh, be too personal, but these are these are these are yeah. this is personal to me because um, th th these are these are suburbs that, that were directly impacted more than other places in this. Um, so just to add that kind of personal note, just just one second. Uh, the formulation is, it, it, it is I think relatively real, you know, could build on something like Andy Sterling's work, right? Opening out and uh, opening up and broadening out, right? So broadening out the, 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 the range of inputs and then and then opening up the, 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 the stage of outputs, right? So what do we need? We need a diverse range of inputs into the policy process as, as to what constitutes equity. And we need a broad range of possible outcomes as to how to implement those, those concepts in practice, right? So I can imagine that as a, as a kind of standing policy capability that actually sees equity as a, as a, as a way of organising entryways, of like, you know, kind of, Inputs and outputs to policy processes. So it's not a set and forget kind of kind of kind of, kind of topic. Do you know what I mean? But if you want to say, hey, equity, hand wave it, blah, 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 and then everyone kind of thinks that they kind of know what equity means. To me, to me, the point is th this is a side of, of profound kind of an, an ongoing unsettling of, of, of some of those key concepts, right? So the, the, we don't want necessarily want a, a kind of one size fits all kind of definition of those words, right? We actually want the capability to ask and re-ask what those words mean, I think. Thank you, Matt. Uh, Fiona, last word. Oh, this shouldn't be the last word, but um, I'm just kind of reflecting on the project that we've just done, re-reviewing 4,000 papers across eight social science disciplines. And, you know, what strikes me is, is just how far there still is to go. You know, the proportion of the studies, these were all quantitative studies, but the proportion of those studies that were still using kind of non-weird sampling strategies that are still done on first-year psychology undergraduates, like there's, there's just so, there's so far to go in some disciplines so we're talking about equity in terms of the participants who we study or who evaluates research that's done. On that note, um, it is 12.30, uh, and I don't want to stand between you and lunch. Um, but before we go, um, please join me in thanking the wonderful uh, panel panelists and also comments from the floor um, for a really rich discussion, which I think, um, yeah, there were plenty of engagements there with the research priority questions, so I'm happy. Thank you. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Siddhartha, for such wonderful moderation. I just wanted to put in a plug. Uh, uh, the president of 4S is here. Uh, 4S is the, um, the annual conference of the Society for the Social Studies of Science, where many of these kinds of discussions are, you know, kind of very central uh, to, the, to the conference. And uh, this is happening in Honolulu, so you couldn't ask for a better, you know, location for the conference. It's happening, I think, late November, if I'm not mistaken. Early, early November, yeah. Um, earlier than it happened this year, which is in December. So uh, early November in Honolulu, um, and the, the I think call for open panels has closed, but there'll be uh, opportunities to put in uh, submissions, I think, uh, in, a, in a little while. So the open submissions will, sorry, closed panels will open in a, in a short while. So yeah, um, maybe uh, we'll continue these discussions in Honolulu. <laughs> I think of worst case. <laughs> Lunch, everyone. It's just outside.